Let's all stand. Let's bow our hearts. Lord, we want to come before you this morning, invite you into our service, ask that you be with us and anoint the, the word that we're going to hear, anoint our ears to hear it and receive it. We, uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, the fragrance after rain. Jesus, 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 in the heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall There's something about that name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name. Long 
Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus, when Jackson broke his arm, if you all hadn't heard, and uh, this morning he got his cast wet in the bathtub, and now the cast is all soggy, and they need him to not, his arm not to move until tomorrow, <laughs> so they can get the cast reset, because they're afraid that the bone hasn't healed all the way yet, so um, if uh, y'all keep him in prayer, make sure his arm doesn't um, get damaged until tomorrow. Um, and also, Brother George um, uh, Buckman uh, had a prayer request, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, prayer request for my father this morning um, as a dizziness he has experienced in the past has returned to trouble him again we prayed together this morning and he is planning to go to church so I want to keep him in prayer um, Brother Luther Amen, God bless you pleasant surprise for the Smith family to be here today we're very thankful for that um Sister Paula Taylor also sent in a prayer request that her whole family is suffering with the COVID, her whole household, she put. I don't know anything more than that, whether, you know, she has several kids or, but she sent that request in also. So if you have a request on your heart this morning, let's just, I have so many requests that just, they're all right there. And he knows every one of them. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I love you, Jesus. I praise you and I thank you, Father, for, Lord, that you came to me, took me out of this world, Father. Lord, you look around, there's so many, Father, that just, they don't have any idea that you even exist, Father. They don't want to know. And I, Lord, would be just like one of them, but for the grace of God, for God, rich in mercy. I thank you, Jesus. And Lord, help me to, to be what you'd have me to be, Father. And Lord, as Brother George suffering with dizziness, Lord. And our little Elijah, Father, with his arm. And our sister with her household, Father. Lord, with this unseen enemy. But because we serve a God that can see all things, knows all things. We lift these requests up before you, Father. I come against that COVID disease in the name of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Lord. Touch our brother George, Father. Just, Lord, I've suffered dizziness in the past, Father. 
Lord, I pray that you help them, that you just straighten it all out, Father. And Lord, that you just help our little brother, Elijah Jackson, Father, and just keep it so that, Lord, when he goes tomorrow, everything's just fine. And Lord, we pray for the tithes and offerings. Pray that you just magnify it to your kingdom. Bless the cheerful giver. Bless those that are streaming. Father, we're coming to a great meeting one day. We do not want to forsake that one, Lord. Bless your people today, Father, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we're going to have a special uh, with our sister grandma and the world-renowned sister Joanne. <laughs> so, uh, I got a mic. Um, what's going to be the best way to run the mics on this? Should I use my lapel or... Because I'm going to sing with them. I'm going to sing as well, yeah? Okay. And then Grandma can use this? Okay. A ship sailing out on a trip so rough and long, so far from shore, so far from home. I said.
Let's um, let's sing. Uh, Nobody loves me like you. Morning, see you in the sunrise every morning. I picture that you painted. like I'm surrounded you never leave my side nobody loves me like you love me Jesus I stand in awe of your amazing ways I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Morning, I see you in the sunrise every morning. It's like a picture that you painted for me, love letter in the sky, story I could have had a really different story, but you came down from heaven to stand in awe of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Nobody loves me like you. Love me, Jesus. I stand in awe of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. change the order of the service here. Um, We'll sing uh, uh, Standing Somewhere in the Shadows.
Let's all stand as we change the order. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you find Jesus. He's the one who cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him, and you'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. And I shall know him. I shall know. stand I shall know what okay uh <laughs> okay uh, executive order from Brother Jason. Sister Joanne has to sing two specials today.
Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Oh, somebody's praying for me. Some Now we can all stand and change the order of the service. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's sing that song, same song we're singing. I like that. Uh, somewhere in the shadows you find Jesus. He this morning. Are you thankful to be a Christian yes. and to be serving the Lord this morning? God bless you. Amen. Good to see all of you. Good to see Brother Dale, Sister Joanne. Amen. I got that executive order there, um, <clears throat> not from the Secret Service, but from our pastor. Uh, and so I had to come out here and make a quick adjustment. 
We've got these real hot here, Brother Kevin, if you want to turn those down just on this uh, monitor here. And then had to make a quick uh, adjustment there for Brother uh, for Brother Matthew, so I hope I didn't start on him too bad. Um, but good to see Brother Dale. Amen. I, I uh, and and you know I I know that um, this morning I was telling Brother Dale I was laughing. He's here, and I know that while he's here, he's getting uh, his house on Ladies Island for sale. And so this morning I was I was talking to my grandmother, and she said, "Who's preaching today?" And I told her I was preaching. So Memo, good morning. God bless you. Uh, telling on you a little bit this morning, but. She said, who's preaching? I said, I'm preaching this morning. She said, good. She said, is there a Sunday school? I said, yeah. She said, who's, who's teaching? And I said, Brother Dale. And the phone call got real silent. She said, you run Brother Dale out of town. <laughs> and I started laughing. She said, gee, I know when he, when he sells, he's going to sell that house. We may lose Sister Dorothy. Don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that was a secret and I wasn't supposed to tell that. But, uh, but Brother Dale, you're not too popular uh, right now, maybe with my grandma, but it's still good to see you here. Amen today. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. No, we're so glad to have them. Uh, so glad to see them. And I know that they're glad to see their family. I know Brother Travis told me they were all at the airport last night. Surprised Brother Dale, Sister Joanne. So it's good to see them. Good reunion. Amen. We still are my family, my wife, all of the kids, my mom, my dad, my grandmother, all of the rest of them are uh, and still in quarantine today. And so talking to my grandma today, she said, <clears throat> she said, well, I said, how you doing? She said, well, I'm doing good. She said, <laughs> she said, I'm going to need to get my house repainted when I'm out of quarantine. I said, why? She said, because I've been climbing on my walls. <laughs> she said, I've been climbing the walls, just uh, itching to get out. So we want to just say uh, God bless you to them, to all of those streaming. Amen. And, and, uh, and my wife uh, is doing a lot better. Uh, all of the family, Jonathan also, who had tested positive earlier, uh, is doing real good. So, amen. Good to see that uh, we, the, David said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord God delivereth them out of them all. Amen. Right, Brother Joe? Amen. Good to see here, him here this morning. If you have your Bible, that'll be all the music, um, all the worship today. Thank you. I'd like you just to turn um, to Psalms chapter 13. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 13, I don't think I'm missing uh, any announcements. I want to make sure that I'm not. Amen. I got a lot uh, here this morning that I just want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, as I know it was Him who led me, and I begin to just deal with my thoughts in this direction. And so I'm going to be real uh, today's sermon will be very uh, practical, and it's just how the Lord dealt with me. But I'd like to, even my title this morning, I'd like to give it to you now, and you'll see where we're going with this in Psalms chapter 13. <clears throat> and brothers, if you have that put on the screen, you can put that on the screen. I may end up sending you a PowerPoint. I'm not sure yet. I may still do it. It's ready. So if I do, just be ready to throw it up there real quick. Amen. It wouldn't be tradition if I gave it to you guys early. So I had to uh, wait and... Uh, Wait, not only while I'm about to be on the stage, but now I'm out here. So just be ready. Psalms chapter 13. I'd like to preach to you this morning, and I'd like to title this, When It Doesn't Make Sense. When It Doesn't Make Sense. Psalms chapter 13. How long will thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will, thy, will thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in the mercy and thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Amen. Let's just pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Lord, we've read it today. We've expressed it, Lord, and even in our own heart as we read some of these words, how that our own reflections can immediately flood our mind. Lord, of how often we've been in this place where David is. Lord, praying and asking you, Lord, how long, O oh Lord? I pray, God, that your word would be, Father, may it be very 
Lord, comforting to your people. May it speak to their hearts specifically, Lord. I know, God, that you move, Lord, in mysterious ways. I trust you, Lord, and I lean upon you. Now, may you just come and bless it. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to move this. We know that the Bible declares so many things about David, and it calls him a man after my own heart. The Lord said, uh, I'll give you a man after mine own heart. And so David repeats this in Psalms chapter 13. And we're just going to go through this slowly here. We'll go through some of these verses and just lay out maybe a foundation and see uh, where, where the Lord brings us to this morning. But I I think it's amazing because he goes through this uh, cry here in Psalms chapter 13, and he says, we're just going to read verse 1 again, how long will thou forget me, O Lord? And then he asks, forever? How long will will thou hide thy face from me? It's amazing because you don't find anywhere in Psalms 13 that I could find that David has sinned. There's prayers that you'll read that he prays after sin. Psalms 55 would be one of them. But we don't have any indication here that David is praying because uh, of some uh, trap that he's fallen into or some sin in his life. But actually, this was uh, the enemy who was uh, trying to kill him and trying to take his life. And in spite of all of David's prayers and praying out to God, and in spite of how many times he had no doubt cried unto the Lord, he's saying this in Psalms 13, how long will thou forget me, O Lord? Because no doubt he had cried unto the Lord. He had petitioned God. He had brought his need to the Lord already in times past. He had maybe consulted the Lord. We see this as something that, Paul says, I consulted the Lord three times to ask him to take it away from me. Same exact language where you have the Apostle Paul saying and confessing, you're not the only one who has approached God more than one time for a need in your life. And so many times, you know, we could say that here today that there's been multiple times, maybe something that you're praying about today or you've considered and asked the Lord and you've petitioned from your heart and you, you've, you've asked the Lord for something specific in your life or you're praying about the, uh, the will of God. And, you know, sometimes we can, uh, if we, you know, we can become in this, we can get to this place that, that David was where we could say this from our hearts and say, how long, Lord? will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? He says in verse 2, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And it seems that David is, is asking this petition and he's crying out to God. And you know, that can be a very discouraging thing for a believer. It can become to the point to where the mind battle of why God isn't answering is worse than the fact that he hasn't answered. Yeah. Sometimes it can become more perplexing trying to find the will of God than the will of God itself. And just to say, Lord, I'm in such a quandary, I've, I've petitioned you, I've asked you, maybe prayers over, uh, you know, an unsaved loved one, maybe a child or a, a situation in your home or in your health or whatever uh, front the enemy is attacking because the enemy attacks on all levels. If he can't get you mentally, he'll attack you physically. And if he can't attack you physically, he'll come to you spiritually. And then if he can't get there, he'll come into some root of bitterness and attach you attack you emotionally. Can I preach to somebody this morning? And so on all fronts, uh, Satan is, is, uh, can bombard us. And uh, David was crying over his own life. And it seemed like God was just unavailable. It seemed like God had just taken a vacation. This is what he's expressing here in Psalms 13. It seems like I've petitioned you. I've prayed. I've, I've brought my request. I've made them known. I've obeyed the scriptures. I've, I, I don't understand. This just doesn't make any sense to me, God. And there's sometimes God doesn't make sense. 
There's times when his word uh, for applying to our life and there's a certain situation and uh, whatever it would be this morning, sometimes it just doesn't make sense and we can ask that question, uh, why, Lord? What, what, as David is asking here, why? Uh, why? Why did it happen? Why did I, why, did, why, did, why, why am I at this place that I'm at right now? And you can look back over your life sometime and the devil will be quick to remind you of all of the, the obedience that you've had and all of the things you've done for the Lord and all that you've given up. Just as he did, Brother Branham, oh, look at you. You've given up everything for him. You've preached and everybody's rejected you. And what have you done for the Lord? Notice, he wasn't, the devil didn't come to Brother Branham just highlighting his baby. Are you here today? But he started going over his life and his ministry and saying, look at what you've done for the Lord. Look at how you've lived for him. Uh, you've preached and you, you've had nowhere to lay your head. You've been in meetings for hours and hours and hours. And, and he says, and you've given up everything. And Brother Branham says, yeah, that's true. This is the, the perplexity David was in when he says, you know, it just seems like God is not speaking. He's not available. It's, it's, it seems that he's, so distant from me. And oftentimes that's exactly if we'd uh, be honest here today, sometimes it seems like God has forgotten you. Sometimes it seems like if he's not forgotten you, he's hiding from you. He's hiding his face from you. And, and, and David asked this question in such a, just in such a real uh, way that we could so relate to. And he says, how long will you forgive me, O Lord? Forever? Forever, David just asked, is it going to be forever? Is, this, is it always going to be like this, Lord? Is it just going to keep lasting and going on and on and on? And it seems like sometimes we can go through certain struggles in our life and trials in our life, and it just feels like it's lasting forever. Amen. And it seems like there's just no end in sight. And it just seems like it's, it's just drawn out and, 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 it's, and it's long. And how long am I going to go through this? And, you're, and it just seems like such a waiting period. And man, we hate to wait. We hate to wait. I don't care if I'm waiting on my kids, if I'm waiting on my family, if I'm waiting at the stoplight, or if I'm waiting on God. We hate to wait. Right. Some of us hate it worse than others. But waiting is especially hard when you don't have anything to occupy yourself. When you don't have anything to do, you're just, you're just waiting. It feels like you're waiting for nothing. And, and, it, and, it, and it's, it is just a, it seems like just a, such a, in the, and you can notice this in Psalms. This is Psalms 13 where David is being pursued by a man who he tried to save. Now remember, this was, came out of a righteous act. This is after David's anointing. After Samuel pours the anointing oil over his head and the oil's running from his head down through his beard and he's anointing him as king and, he's, and, he's, and it's all about the projection of where David's going to be and where he's going to finally end up and where uh, after, it's not, it's not just the here and now, David, but it's the ultimate picture of where you're going to be, where your life's going to end up. It's never, the problem never comes with the beginning of the anointing or where the anointing's going to end. It's what happens in the middle that we have so much trouble with. Amen. If you could lay out the life of men of God, take Joseph, uh, you know, uh, just for example, if you could lay out their life and we can look at it linearly. Uh, 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 can I say that word right? Linear. If we can look at it linear. And you were to lay out almost like a 3D scale. If you were to ever look at a 3D or, or a, 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 you know, like a city that you could look at, you know, like a little um, city, miniature city. And you could look at uh, and shrink the life of Joseph. And you were to look at the, the, from the time that he gets the dream. And here he comes with the dream and God's going to, you know, what, what God, well, the, 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 the vision that God has for his life. He has the coat of many colors. And, and we know De uh, Joseph's entire life of the promise that God has given him. But so much had happened, if you look at it linear, so much had happened from the time he had gotten the dream all the way to the time he's sitting on the throne. Now, we'd love to just fast forward and go straight from the vision, straight from the dream, straight from the promise to the tower, to the kingdom, to the throne. 
but it's, it's, you have to understand that it's what happens in the middle that brings you to the throne. It's what happens in the middle. It's what happens from the anointing running down David's beard uh, to the time when he's sitting in Jerusalem as the king. It's God says, David, in order for me to get you from the anointing to the place I'm trying to bring you, you've got to go through what's in the middle because the secret is in what's in the middle. Because your character to sit on that throne happens in the middle. Hallelujah. Joseph, for you to ever sit at, uh, on the throne, you've got to go through the slavery. You've got to go through being sold. You've got to go through Potiphar's house and through the prison. And David, before you ever get to the throne, you've got to go through the cave of Adullam where you're running for your life. You imagine just the, the, the shock that he has. <laughs> As many times we don't, we get the promise of God, but we don't see everything that's going to happen in the middle. And, 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 and no doubt, David never seen this coming. And there he is running for his life. And uh, as we said, he's being chased by, by, by Saul. And he's holed up. He's a, he's a, Brother Branham calls him a renegade. And he's running and he's just a renegade. And, 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 the, and he's, he's, a, he's a nobody at this time. He's not a king. He doesn't have a throne. He doesn't have an army. Doesn't have men, uh, doesn't have a great, 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 uh, ch- great, great, uh, a great army to fight for him. He just has a few men who are faithful to David. And the Bible says that David is, is, begins to cry this. And he says, how long? Consider and hear me, O Lord. In verse 3, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I prevailed against him and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. He's here in the desolate wilderness of Judah. And about all that he has at this time is just the men that he and his daily provisions. Just a few men that are around him and his daily provisions. And he's, 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 he's hiding for uh, days and then uh, days are hours and then hours turn into days and days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months and months turn into years sometimes through that middle stage. And he's, and, and, and no doubt it, this seems to just drag on and drag on and drag on. And my, how long is this going to drag on? And it's just going on and on before God uh, begins to act and begin, begins to speak. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's God moves. Brother Branham said the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost isn't hasty. So don't be hasty. He's not in a hurry. You know, we get in a hurry, but God's not in a hurry. God's not in a hurry. Amen. And sometimes it seems God is moving slower than what we want to move at. And he's moving at a slower pace and God's moving slow. And it seems like we live in that, the age of such, Brother Branham called it uh, the, the age of neurotics. And he says, it's just a pressurized age and you're constantly under pressure. And you're in a hurry, 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 go, 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 only to stop and wait. You remember that and letting off the pressure. He says, you go from one place... And if we're not careful, we can, we can, this, can, this can trickle down into our relationship with the Lord. Or we're just in a hurry. Just come on, God, just speed it up. I mean, let's, let's, let, 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 let's go. You know, let's go. What, what are we waiting on? Let's, let's hurry. I'm, I've already got anointed. Give me the throne. Yeah. I already got my anointing. Let me be king now. Yeah. No, David, you got to go through the wilderness. You got to go through the rejection. You got to go through the misery. Because the only way you'll ever be fit for the throne is if you can come through times in your life where it just doesn't make any sense. And God is moving and moving and moving. And, and, and it's amazing because God has such a different, I just want to slow down on this lest I just gloss over it. Sometimes it feels like God has such a different timetable than us. We would have thought, Years ago, we would have been out of here. Yeah. Amen. You'd have never thought you where you are where you are right now. Amen. You never would have thought here we are at 2021. <laughs> you never would have thought that. Amen. Never thought I'm at 2021. You got to be kidding. Right. And we got it. We got a, a new administration, and the world's just going to. How long is this going? God's timetable is completely different than ours. Yeah. 
And we can think in terms of hours and minutes and days, but, and, and, and sometimes God works in years or he works in a, a timetable that maybe isn't the same as what you're comfortable with. As we said, even the, we pointed to the life of, you think of Joseph's life, if you were to look at it linear, you're able to, to shrink it down to a microscopic size, just to a size where you could look at everything. Now we can see uh, uh, the picture of Joseph's life that God has a plan for him. I'm going to jump here back and forth, so just stay with me here. God has a plan for him. You're going to raise up to a mighty position in Egypt. It's going to ultimately be for the salvation of you and your entire family. You're going to be a ruler over all of Egypt. But it's amazing because when, when, how God gets Joseph there, God says, I've given you a dream. And he says, but how I'm going to place you and what the, where you're going to have to, what you're going to have to go through to get from here to here, Joseph. First, over here, we see about right here's the dream, and about right here, you're going to be sold as a slave. You're going to be sold into slavery, Joseph, and it's going to be hard. It's not going to make sense. It's not going to make sense how I give you a dream with all this potential, and then you're at the bottom of a, of a pit being sold into slavery, rejected by your own family, yeah. Amen. by your own brothers, never would have thought your brothers would have rejected you, never could have imagined it would be family, sometimes family can hurt us worse than anybody, and the rejection of family can hurt us worse than anybody, never would have thought it would have been in my own house, Ray rose up in my own, by my own brothers, Never would have pictured, never would have imagined, but God looks at this whole picture and says, yeah, yeah, about right there, it's going to be slavery, Joseph. It's going to be come by your own, at the hand of your own brothers. And, 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 and this is going to happen. Joseph's, you know, a teenage boy, and he's, there he is. You imagine just the shock, as we said, that he finds himself in, and now he's hauled off. In the, you know, in the, uh, he's hauled off to some foreign land, some foreign nation. Amen. I guarantee you, he didn't expect to be getting hauled off as a slave to a foreign nation when he woke up that day. Amen. Never would have pictured it. Never would have imagined his life would ever get to this place. But about that time, then he, he, he goes, and we know the story. And then you look at the, continue to look at the timetable, and God says, then, Joseph, you're, you're going to come to a place to where you're in Potiphar's house. And about right there, you're going to get accused by Potiphar's wife. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now, God sees, as Brother Branham says over and over and over and over again, God sees the end from the beginning. We don't see the end from the beginning. We trust the word of God. We, we believe the word of God. We stand on the promises of God. But we see what's right in front of us. And for Joseph, he didn't have a blown up view uh, of this timeline of his life where all of these events are going to take place. All Joseph is living in is the here and now. He knows what's taking place to him now. He knows how he's affected right now. He knows how he feels right now. He's a believer. He has the, uh, a dream from God. He's got a promise from God. But yet, it's not making any sense. Are you here today? About right here, you're going to get accused uh, by Potiphar's wife. You're going to be thrown in the prison. You'll be thrown in the prison, Joseph, if you look at it linear. And you stack all the events up in his life from the time of the dream to the time of the throne. About right there, you're going to, you're going to be in prison. You're going to be thrown into prison. And a long time, we got a long time is going to go by. You say, God, what's in that long time? Nothing. Nothing. Wait, what are you doing right there in that little, in that long space? Because that could mean, that could represent years. And for Joseph, it did represent years. Nothing. <laughs> what, 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 what's going to take place? Well, it's going to seem like nothing to you, but I'm doing something. Amen. It's going to seem like nothing to you. 
And sometimes in the moments when it feels like nothing to us, God is doing the most in our life. Because he's doing not an external work, but he's doing an inward work. Something on the inside of our hearts. And Joseph, in that moment, you're going to go through that space there. You're going to be thrown into prison and you're going to be forgotten in that prison, Joseph. Long time goes by. You know, you imagine many times in that, if we could move the, if we could zoom in on the timeline, I'm sure somewhere in that prison, Joseph got down on his knees and began to fervently pray. Fervently. Fervently. Not hypocritically. Not with, not with any pretense. But Joseph is praying sincerely. Thank you. He's praying sincerely. He's praying fervently. God, deliver me from this prison. Deliver me from this, from this affliction. Uh, do, 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 how, can you get me out of here, God? I'm believing, Lord, you're going you're gonna to deliver me. You're going to get me out of here. Humanly, now I'm just going to speak humanly here. It seemed like God didn't even hear. He just sits and sits and sits and sits and time goes by. Finally, an opportunity comes about right here. About right here, Joseph. Now, you're not going to see this. Uh, you're, you're not gonna. You're not gonna look at this view. I'm not gonna give you this view. I'm gonna put you right in the middle of it. And about right there, there's gonna come an opportunity for you, Joseph. <clears throat> when the interpretation of dreams, couple fellow inmates, the butler and the baker, we know the story. King's cupbearer would be released from prison. And he's restored after, after all of the, after uh, it looked like an opportunity, he's going to get out of jail. Looks like God's doing something. He's finally working in his life. Amen. And then that, that king's cupbearer gets released from prison and gets restored back to his position. And you know what Joseph says to that man? He says, remember me. That's what he tells him. Remember me. And he pleads with him. And he says, when you get out, when, you, when you're out, just remember me and, 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 make, and get me out of here. Get me out of this prison. I want to I get out. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the agony? Could you imagine the playground that the devil had on his mind? Could you imagine the, the, the whispers that Satan was whispering every night as he laid his head just another night in the prison cell? Could you imagine how much of a punching bag Joseph felt like for the devil? God's forgotten you. The cupbearer tells him, oh, don't worry. Don't worry, Joseph, I got this. And you know what happens? He forgets. He forgets him completely. The next verse, Genesis 41.1 says, now it happened. Genesis 41.1, Brother Josh, if you want to bring that up, I want to have it on the screen. (laughs) The next verse here in Genesis 41.1, notice how it says this here. I'm going to wait for you to get it. This is after all of the, this is after the, the opportunity. <laughs> no doubt expectation. No doubt Joseph's thinking, oh, this is, you know, here's a chance. Here's an opportunity. And it says here, it says, now it happened at the end of two full years Amen. that Pharaoh had a dream. Now it happened at the end of two full, notice how the Bible writes that? Intentionally. It happened after the end of two full years. Two long years. Pharaoh had a dream. Two years. Think, Think just for a moment. Go back two years in your life. Go back. That's a long time. Now you know why David's praying words and says, how long, Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long, God? Joseph could say, how long, Lord? Forever? I'm just going to die. Now, notice, I want want to make sure you get this. We know, we smile, we say amen because we see this picture. And we have an assurance. We know that he goes through prison, but he gets out of prison. He goes to the throne, but Joseph didn't know that. 
For all Joseph knew, he was going to die in that prison cell. For all Joseph knew, that was the end of it all. For all David knew, I got an anointing, but I mean, chased down. For all David knew, he was going to be, he was going to be killed by, by Saul. For two long years, two full years, Joseph languishes. He's waiting in prison. You know, why? You ask the question, God, could you not have given Pharaoh a dream a little few nights before? Why couldn't you have given him this dream two years before? Why the two years? Why the waiting? Amen. Why, th why, why this, why this timeline, Lord? Why, do, why am I going through it? It's, it's uh, in all of these. It just doesn't make sense, Lord. Joseph spends the better part of his twenties either a slave. Or in prison in Egypt. Amen. Goes through all of his 20s of his life. And that's his, that's his memory. Goes through all of that time. We, we took Paul, even the Apostle Paul, who, you, who the Bible says, I consulted the Lord. I, taught, I asked him three different times on three occasions. Here was the greatest, uh, here was the Apostle Paul. And the Bible says that he had done so much work for the Lord. You look at all of his life. And the Bible says, it, Paul goes all the way for all, all over Europe. You look at the journeys of Paul in such a small amount of time, such a small little window, and all of the great things God did through the life of Paul. So much, so much accomplished, so little time that he did, that he did it in. He goes all the way to Rome. But how did God get Paul to Rome? Through prison. Their beatings, their scourgings, imprisoned him on a false charge, completely falsely accused. Remember Paul and Silas there in, in prison? False charge. They didn't do anything wrong. Completely false. If anybody ever had a reason to say, I don't deserve this, it was Paul and Silas. But yet, what's their reaction in prison? with, with, uh, with uh, chains on their hands. The Bible says they begin to sing a song unto the Lord, begin to worship Him, begin to praise Him. Amen. It, was, it was through all of that, after two years, even when Paul's, it's amazing because even when Paul's fa falsely charged in, in, in uh, Caesarea, and you go read the story with Felix, and if you go read that verse in Acts, it says, but after two years... The Bible says, I thought I had it written down here. Uh, in Acts 24, 27, it says, after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Festus. And wishing to the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul imprisoned. Left him imprisoned two years. David's going through the same exact thing. He had been anointed as a king, as we said, on his linear timeline. He gets his anointing, but now David is anointed king by a prophet, has a promise when he's a teenager, but now he's running for his life in the caves. Yeah. Amen. He's running for his life, anointed, but running. <laughs> You know, no doubt he goes through all of those teenage years and now he's in his 20s, very much like Joseph. And David could could, is crying this out, how long, Lord, will thou forgive me uh, forever? How long will thou hide thy face from me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, lest mine enemies say I've prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. Where, where's God? Where is he? Have you forgotten about me, Lord? Perhaps you maybe can relate in your own life, when it feels like the Lord is so distant, so far, seems like God is doing nothing, but God is doing something. I said, it seems like God is doing nothing, but God is doing something. He doesn't slumber and he doesn't sleep. He's always working. He's always busy. Maybe not in the ways that you think he should be. Maybe not in the ways that you feel him or are used to feeling him. But God is ever busy about his promises. He's ever tending to his garden, which is you. He's ever, he's ever busy. May it, maybe it seemed like a silent time for David's life, but God was building character 
that was fit to rule on a throne. God was doing something in David's heart through the silence and through the forsaken feeling that he himself is experiencing. And it seemed like to David, seemed like his enemy was winning. You, you know, that, that makes it worse. When you get to a place to where you feel like the devil's winning, not only am I losing, not only am I, di- not only does the Lord feel distant, but it looks like Saul's winning. Looks like he was just winning. You imagine here's Saul and it looks like he's, uh, to, to, to David, he's still the king. He's still in the palace. Here, I've saved his life. I've spared his life and he's coming after me. And here I am sleeping in caves. Uh, Saul's not out seeking the Lord. Saul's not out fervently praying for the Lord, but I am. God, don't you know what's happening? Don't you know what you're doing? Don't you know I'm the good guy? Don't you know, Lord, that it, uh, w- w- what I've done? Lord says, oh, I, I've know, I know all about it, David. I know all about it. Yes, You're preaching to the choir. Because David doesn't know his life is actually a representation of the life of Christ. Joseph doesn't know that what he's going through is just a type of what Jesus is going to go through. He doesn't see it. All he sees is that we have the linear picture of everything he goes through. But God never tells him. And so his confidence, you notice this even here. You know, we we preached this uh, maybe, I guess it was a couple years ago now. And I was going back to it, even reading in Exodus. You can go back and read the story. Uh, you, 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 you hear about even what we just read in David and what we read about Joseph. And the, the Bible says this, the same exact thing about, about, uh, about Jehoshaphat when he goes to pray. It's amazing because we know that the Lord is the ruler. He's the, he's the king. He, he's the, he's the, he's the, he, there is no dictator uh, in the economy of God. He's a sovereign king. He rules by love, not by law, not by condemnation. He rules by grace. His precepts are mercy and grace and love. But he's Lord over everything. David, he's Lord over the good times in your life and he's Lord in the bad times. He's king and sovereign in the cave and he's king and sovereign on the throne. Glory. He's king and sovereign in the times of daylight and the nighttime. He's the God of the mountain and he's the God of the valley. He's the Lord of all creation. The Bible says that, he says, he ruleth in Psalm 66, 7. He ruleth by his power forever. That's that's forever. Not not just in the the Bible times. He's still ruling right now. He's still on the throne right now. He's still controlling what's happening in the government and in the world right now. Over every nation, over every kindred, over every tongue, over every dictator, over every president. He is king. The Bible says in Psalms 93, 1, it says the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Verse 5, thy testimonies are very sure. This was the same man who prays in Psalms 13 and says, How long, O Lord, will thou forget me forever, O God? How long will I consult in my soul? Uh, and, and, and he says, how long, Lord? This is the same one in Psalms 93. Thy testimonies are very sure. Amen. Thy testimonies are sure. Thy statutes are just. Thy, thou reignest forever. And he says, Lord, your decrees, your laws, your word are irrevocable. Your law. Now, the law of the land you take the law of a, of, a, of a president. Well, that can be changed. The law of a Congress, that can be changed. Law of the Senate, that can be changed. Local law here in Buford could be superseded you know, by, a, by a higher power. And then they could supersede that. Then the Supreme Court could overthrow that. But let me tell you something about this law. Nothing supersedes this. This is irrevocable. This is the Supreme Court. This is the Supreme Court. <clears throat> People think they vote in justices and, they, they, and that, that's, that's the, the highest law of the land. That's not the highest law of the land. This is the highest law of the land. This is the Supreme Court. And there is the Supreme Judge. And David says this. He says, your testimonies, your laws are irrevocable. They're not just irrevocable laws. They're reliable. I can rely upon them. 
That's what he's saying. Your testimony is sure. It has integrity. It has foundation. It has stability. I don't need to question it. It's solid. It's irrevocable. It's reliable. Even Paul, even you go read the book of Hebrews, says the same exact thing. In Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to give you a very famous uh, verse here. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Anybody know that? That's that verse. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Paul's echoing the same thing David was. Your laws are irrevocable. They're forever. They're from everlasting to everlasting. Your words are from everlasting uh, to everlasting. You even notice the, the law that he put in the earth uh, to rule the moon, to rule the, the tides. The, 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 the law to, 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 to rule the movement of the sun and the earth and the moon and the stars. Uh, heavenly, uh, the, the heavenly bodies that we have, they are sure. They are forever. They are eternal. An eternal part of God. Brother Branham said the earth was in the book of life. It's an eternal part of God. Amen. An eternal attribute. And it's forever. David says that. It's forever. We're told all the way, and you notice this, all the way throughout the entire Bible. I want to read you, so go, just take a pause from that here for a moment. The Bible says, but without even turning, it says... That, that he's that, that, that the scripture says that the, that we have a high priest who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Do you believe that? Amen. You think God wasn't touched by David's words? How long will thou forget me, O Lord? The Bible says he's a high priest who can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. It says in another place in the Old Testament, it says he bottles up. David said that he bottles up our tears. He says, in, the, in thy bottle thou hast held all my tears. Every tear I've cried. Yeah. Every sorrow that I've had. Lord, you, you felt. You're a high priest who can be touched after the feelings of our infirmities. You bottle every tear. But let me, let me pause from that here just for a moment because we believe that about the attribute of God. He's a high priest who can be touched. He bottles every tear. He's compassionate. He's loving. But let me tell you something also about the Lord. He's a righteous, sovereign king. And his word is sure and it's everlasting. He's a righteous, sovereign God. And his word, his word is his thoughts. And his thoughts is his words. And his words is his constitution. It's his law. It's his rule. It's what he believes. Not the opinion of some man. Not the opinion of some group of men. This is the constitution of God. This is the law that he lives by. This is his word. The Bible says where the word of a king is, there is power. And who can say unto him, what doest thou? This is speaking of the Lord. Solomon was speaking of the Lord. Where the word of a king is, there is power. When he speaks... He's a sovereign. He's the Lord. And let me say it like the prophet of God said it. He is, he is bound to his own word. <laughs> I love that. I was rejoicing last night listening to the Brother Brandon preach that. God proving his word. God keeps his word. And Brother Brandon says, why does God keep his word? Because he's bound to his own word. His opinion can't be changed. There's going to be no dissent to this word. There's going to be no opinions or, or some group of, of, of uh, you know, some consensus of how we should change the word. The word is unchanging. And he's bound to it. It's his word. It's his decree. And it's irrevocable. And it's reliable. And it's sure. And it will last forever. It'll last forever. It's his constitution. It's exactly what he believes. It's what he rules by. It's what he will judge the world by. Amen. Amen. Did you hear me? Yeah. It's what Brother Branham says is what he'll judge the world by. Oh, I, I can hear the words of Brother Branham say it over and over. He is, God is duty bound. He is duty bound to keep his own word. Amen. He's duty bound to keep his own word. It has, he rules by it. 
He judges the earth by it. Everything that you have that you interact with consists and was created by that word. And Brother Branham says he'll judge the world by that word. Oh, let me just say this to you, my brother. You can hold this book. If you got your Bible, put it in your hand. You can hold this book right now and say, if there is something that is sure in this world, I got something that is sure. If I've got something that is irrevocable, I got it right here. I've got something that God is bound to. He is tied to. He can't reject it. It's part of himself. You can hold the Bible in your hand and you can know who God is. The Bible tells us his nature, his promises, his judgments, his laws from his own mouth and it's what he rules by. It's a word that the Bible says he has bound himself to. Do you know every judge today, they swear by a law? The judge is duty bound. That judge is duty bound to the law. Now, that law can change. And then that judge is now dutifully bound by that law, by the change law. Are you here? Even, even today, they determine cases according to law that is established. Laws that are already established. Precedent. You ever heard that word? Yeah. <clears throat> and then you ever, you ever heard of a binding precedent? Right. It's something that a judge will immediately go to because it's a binding precedent. It's something that is, that is sure. Some, it's, a, it's an absolute. It's an anchor, something he can rule by. If he doesn't have a law, he can't rule. He doesn't have to rely. A judge doesn't rely, or does he have to rely upon his feelings? Are you here? He doesn't have to rely upon feeling sorry for the defendant or feeling sorry for this or or what what does he think? He's not swayed by his emotions because he's got a law he can go back to. By that binding law, he's bound to, to execute the law. Amen. That's his own, that's the word that he's bound to. And, and, and he's, his judgment, his rulings are issued based upon that. They are guided by a constitution. And he's up, he has to uphold his rulings, have to be upheld and bound to that constitution. Amen. Well, likewise, God rules and judges everything by a word. And he is the righteous judge. And he has a constitution. And he is bound to that constitution. Are you here today, friends? He's got an established law and it's not based upon his feelings. It's not based upon his emotions. It's not based upon anger. It's not based upon love. It's based upon his word. And his word is sure. David said it's from everlasting to everlasting. It doesn't change with me or with you. It doesn't change with this president or that president or this time or that time. His word is sure. It lasts forever. It's his constitution. It's his established word. When he rules, he rules by a living word. And he is bound. You say, Brother Matt, why are you you preaching this? Just hold on. He is bound to that word. I love to remind myself of that. You ought to remind yourself of that this morning. God is bound to his own word. He's anchored to his own word. The king, the judge, this king, this judge. You say, Brother Matt, why is that important for David? Why why was that important for Joseph? Why is that important for Paul? The same reason it's important for you. Because if God's bound by his own word, then we can hold God to his own word. And in the times when it doesn't make sense, you know what you ought to do? You ought to remind God of his own word. You ought to, I said, you ought to remind God of his own word. In fact, in Isaiah, he tells them that. He says, remind me of my own law. What is it? Is it you think God suddenly needs to be reminded? He goes, oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, gee, I'm sorry. I forgot. No. But Brother Branham said, but the, the Bible says that God, God is bound, duty bound to his own word, to his own promise. And this is what God says. Therefore, come boldly into the courtroom. Come boldly. 
This is your approach. This is how God told you to approach his throne. Therefore, come boldly into the, unto, the, unto the throne of God that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Approach boldly. This is how God says to make our request. In Philippians, don't be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request, that's your petitions, that's your needs, that's your burdens, that's what you need in life. Let your request be known unto God. Without worry, without fear, without anxiety, without stress, come to the throne of God boldly. Because he's a king, and he's a king that's bound to his own word. And Brother Branham says, you find God. He says, anywhere acting one way in the Bible, he's bound. He said, he's duty bound to act the same way when you approach him under the same circumstances. Do you believe that here today? He says, he's duty bound. He's duty bound. He's bound to his own word. Word, he's bound to it. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. This is Ephesians 3, verse 12, Brother Josh. He says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What is your attitude when you approach the throne of God? Paul says it should be bold. In all boldness. In whom we have, this is Ephesians 3. Notice this. That was Hebrews 4, 16. Ephesians 3, 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence. Notice what he's trying to get to you. You weepy. Oh, Brother Joel says, oh, wowsy, wowsy, woo. (laughs) You're down and downcast and oh, Lord. Uh, Paul says, in whom you should have boldness. And access with confidence by the faith of him. Amen. You approach him boldly. Why, brother man? Because he's bound to his own word. Right. And when it doesn't make sense, you remind him of his own word. Amen. When it doesn't make sense, what did Jehoshaphat do when it didn't make any sense at all? He reminded God of his own word. Go, go, go and look at that here just for a minute. Uh, just, just, just for a moment, we'll, we'll pause from that just for a second. It's 1230, so I'm feeling the crunch from time. Notice what it says here in James chapter 5, verse 16. Just have this written down. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That word effectual comes from a Greek word that means a fixed position, meaning that it's unmovable, unshakable. It's an unshakable mindset. The effectual fervent Prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's a fervency which speaks of boldness. It speaks of an absolute, resolute attitude that this is God's word. I am God's child and I'm coming to remind God of his own promises today. You got need? You got a need this morning? You got something you need from the Holy Spirit? Your attitude should be boldness and say, Lord, I'm your child. I'm coming with your word and I'm here to remind you of your own word this morning, Lord. You are duty bound to your own word. I want to, I want to, I don't have time, but we're just going to take the time. Can I have just a few extra minutes here? Notice what he says here. And this is in, and this is Moses in Exodus chapter 30. Well, we'll, we'll look at Jehoshaphat first. Second Chronicles chapter 20, brother Joshua, we're going to close here just in a moment. Notice what he says here. This is Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, king, righteous king. The Bible says in second Chronicles chapter 20, I know you know this very well. He, he's, he's facing an invading massive, massive army. Multiple, I forget how many kings, three or four kings had, 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 had made an alliance to come and destroy him. Now notice here, the Bible says he's, he's, he's going to face this great army. Just, just go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Brother Josh, put it up on the screen, verse 1. Came to pass after this also the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, but other than beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea of the side of Syria. And behold, they be in Hazan Tamar, which is in Gedi, verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. So here's these people are fasting and praying. Here's Jehoshaphat. Now here he's a king, righteous king. <clears throat> and made a mistake. 
That's why he's in this trouble. But he, the Bible says that he gets this word. They're coming. All of the enemies coming. Multiple armies, king. And the Bible says Jehoshaphat feared and he began to set himself to seek the Lord. The Bible says the people pray. They fast. They're, they're repenting. They're crying out to God. There, 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 there was, there was a, an, a call, just, a, just a, a, a cry out to God, no doubt of despair. Lord, uh, what, what's going to happen to us? The Bible says, And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah. They came to seek the Lord. Amen. And he says here in verse 7, notice this. Notice what, notice what he, here's the people, hold on before that. Here's the people praying. Here's the people fasting. Here's the people, uh, you know, no doubt in the frenzy saying, Lord, what's going to happen? Very much like David. How long are you going to forget me, oh Lord? Uh, forever, Lord? Uh, how long uh, are you going to deliver me, God? Am I going to die here? Joseph could say, I'm just going to rot here in prison. The Bible says Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation. Notice what he begins to say. Here is a king. I want you to remember this. This is a king. A king rules by his word. And now a king begins to talk to the king. And Jehoshaphat says, he brings back, what is he doing? He's bringing back a precedent. He's reminding God of the binding precedent that's in the law. Before you rule, God. Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah, Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court. Notice verse 7. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do, notice how he words this. Do, are, thou, the, the, are not thou our God who did drive out the inhabitants of the land? He says, before thy people and gavest it to thy seed Abraham, thy friend, thy friend forever. Verse 8. And they dwell therein, and they have built the sanctuary wherein the sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, Notice verse 9, keep going, Brother Josh. He says, uh, before thy name saying, notice what, what he begins to remind the Lord of. And he says, Keep keep going, brother. Keep going. I don't have it here before me, so I'm really relying on you. Second Chronicles 24. Okay, yeah, yeah. We want to go. Okay, perfect. Now Jehoshaphat slept. Just pause that here for a moment. He says here, he says, are thou not the Lord? Let me find it in my notes because I have it right here. Chapter 20, verse 6. That's what we did. We went, to, we went one verse too many. And he says, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? In your hand is there not power and might? Notice how he's saying this. In your hands is there not power and might? Is there not, Lord? And he says, he says, is there that, that so that none is with able to, with, to withstand you? And Jehoshaphat, what was he doing? He was reminding God of his word. This wasn't Jehoshaphat's word. This was the word of the Lord. And he says, he's reminding him, Lord, uh, are you not our God of our fathers? Are, are not thou God in heaven and rulest thou not over all the kings of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee. Jehoshaphat is reminding the Lord of his precedent. He's reminding the Lord of his own constitution. He's reminding the Lord of his own words, of his own law. He's saying, God, you are bound to this. This. this is your word, not our word. Amen. Are you here to, are you catching it, friends? Yeah. Jehoshaphat was binding God. Are you not our God who did drive out the inhabitants of this land from before you, your people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend forever? Amen. Is that not you? The Lord could say, yes. Yeah. It's me. And then Jehoshaphat could say, Lord, we are your seed. We are your seed. You promised it to Abraham, thy friend forever. We're, we're, we're Abraham's seed, Lord. This is your word. This is what you said, Lord. I'm just reading back to you what you promised, Lord. I'm a king and I'm held by my word. You're a king and you're bound by your word. We are your seed, Lord. You gave your people an eternal word. And Lord, I'm bringing that word before you now. 
I'm, I'm presenting my case. I'm not going to talk about my problems. I'm not going to talk about my issues. I'm not going to talk about the current circumstance because the kings are coming. They're coming to wipe us out. Here's what I'm going to do, Lord. It doesn't make sense right now. So I'm going to do the only thing I have, and that's your word. And I'm going to remind you of your own word, Lord. You promised it to Abraham, your seed forever. And I'm your seed. And these are your seed. And these are your children, Lord. This is your children, Lord. I'm bringing your word before you now. You promised it. You made a promise to Abraham and our fathers. And the same promise that you made to Abraham was binding binding to Abraham and that same promise is binding to me because why? Because I'm your child and if you're a part of the family of God the promises of God God is bound, duty bound to those promises for you. All you gotta do is claim them and say I'm a son of God I'm a daughter of God and the promise that you made to my fathers before me is bound to my family and my children. Jehoshaphat said Lord they're binding they, are, they were bound to Abraham. Now they're bound to us. <clears throat> you know what God says? God goes further than that. And the Bible says that, a, that a, a, a prophet comes on the scene. And the Bible says that he begins to, begins to say, Stand still, Jehoshaphat. He says, Stand still, Jehoshaphat. And he says, and see the salvation of the Lord. And he says, for the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. The battle is not yours. Stand, you feel. He says, only praise him. That's all you're going to do. You're going to bring the musicians and you're going to begin to praise. And God's going to do the rest. And the Bible goes on to record that Jehoshaphat goes to battle. Now, now what I want you to catch here before we close is that God knew his word before Jehoshaphat rehearsed his word to him. God could have sent that prophet to still the people and to tell them the battle's not yours, it's the Lord. You won't fight today. <clears throat> but he waited for Jehoshaphat to read the word back to him. And when Jehoshaphat began to declare the word of God, God sends a prophet and the prophet comes with a word and says, you won't fight. He says, only in this battle, you won't fight for the battle's not yours. It's the Lord. And you know what Jehoshaphat does? He goes the next day and they set themselves in array with musicians. No swords, no chariots, no army. And the Bible says that Jehoshaphat, as they go into battle, he begins to remind them now of the prophet's words. He goes back. He didn't know. Notice he's not quoting. Now he doesn't quote to the people. He doesn't quote back to God. We're the seed of Abraham. But the Bible says Jehoshaphat begins to say, "Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall pro and you shall be and you shall prosper. Believe in His prophets." And so shall you be established. I may have that backwards, but what's he doing? He's repeating the word of God back to the people. Let this be your confidence that it's not your word. It's not your promise. It's not your, ba it's not even your battle. It's the Lord's battle. And it's not your words. It's the words of God. And it's the words of God's prophet. What you should do today is remind God you sent a word and I'm claiming that word. I'm repeating that word. I'm confessing that word. It's not my word. It's your word, Lord. And now God was bound to the word of the prophet. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Moses finds himself in the same exact place. David finds himself in the... You remember in Exodus, when, when, it, when, it begins, and when Moses begins this conversation with the Lord. And he goes back and forth and back and forth. And you know, for Moses, it, it didn't make any sense. God wasn't making any sense. And you find this as he goes in this dialogue and he goes back and forth with God and back and forth with God. In Exodus chapter 32, if you have that, Brother, uh, Matt, Brother Josh, Exodus 33 verse 8, verse 9, came to pass, I just want to read this, and it came to pass, I'm fixing to close, Brother Dick says, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle to talk with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy the pillar standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped. Now notice this, verse 11. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend and he turned again to the camp. But a servant Joshua, son of the young, young, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, 
You know what he's doing here? This is a conversation. You ever had a conversation with somebody? And you say, see, here's the problem. <laughs> you ever told somebody, said, see, well, you see, you ever go to approach somebody and you got to tell them something. And, what's the problem? You know, what's, what's on your heart? Well, see, here's the issue. That's exactly what Moses is doing. Yeah. See, thou said unto me, bring up thy, this people. And thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Verse 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight. In other words, if that's really true. Show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this, and consider that this nation is thy people. What's Moses beginning to do? He's beginning to remind God. Lord, see, here's the issue I'm having. What's the problem, Moses? The issue I'm having, Lord. You promised this, see. You said this, Lord. You said I found grace in your sight. This is your people. Verse 14, and he said, my presence. This is Moses still. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Verse 15, and he said unto him, if thy presence. God says, my presence shall go with thee, and I shall give thee rest. And Moses says, if thy presence. <laughs> If thou, if, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up in. So in other words, Moses saying, that's good. That's all well, fine and good, God. But let me just tell you right now, in case you didn't hear me the first time, if you don't go, don't send me. Moses, I'm sending you. I know, Lord, I just want to make sure you understand this. My presence shall go with thee, Moses. And I'll give this good. I'm glad you're saying that, Lord, but I'm just letting you know. If your presence doesn't go, uh, don't, don't even carry, carry us up, not up hence. Is what he begins to say. Verse, for wherein shall it be known? Hear that I and thy people. It's, it's like it's not enough. It's not enough for him. He's got to just keep going and keep going and keep going. You've already got the word of the Lord, Moses. He's already promised to you, to you Moses. He's already told you. My presence will go. You've not even told me. My presence will go with me. Good. But if your presence doesn't go. And then he keeps on. For wherein shall that be known that here that I and thy people have found grace on thy side? Is it not that thou goest with us? So we, shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? What's, what's God starting to do? God told Moses. He says, Moses, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go before you. And Moses says, that's good, God. I believe it, you know. I'm a believer. Yeah. That's what believers do. Yeah. I believe your word. But I want to let you know, Lord, just in case, just in case there's any chance, Lord. Moses says, just in case, Lord. I just want to let you know, don't even send me unless you, Lord, I just don't even know. And God says, okay, Moses, okay, okay, I got it. Now, now here's my answer. My presence will go with you and I shall give you rest. You think that'd be enough for Brother Moses? You know why it's not? Because it's not enough for you either. It's not enough for me either. And we got to be told time and time and time and time and time and time again. It would have been enough for Moses. Moses, what are you doing? Well, it just keeps going on. Lord, my presence is going to go with you, Moses. Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing. Also, thou hast spoken of. Thou hast found grace in my sight, and I will know thee by name. And Moses just goes on. And now notice what he does. Go back to verse 16, Brother Josh. He begins to say, For when shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? <clears throat> now, Paul's here. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Do you realize that's not Moses? He didn't alter that statement. Amen. That's literally repeating God's words verbatim back to God. So God says, so thou shall be separated. No, go back to 16, Brother Josh. So thou shall be separated from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. What is Moses doing? He's starting to repeat the word of God back to God. As if God didn't already know this, Moses begins to repeat it. He begins to speak it. He begins to tell it. Why? Because he's binding God to his own word. You promised this, Lord. I didn't promise it. You made this decree, not me. I want to make sure you know this, God. My confidence is not in my thinking because my thinking can change from day to day. My confidence in me, uh, Lord, is nothing. My confidence in my emotions is nothing. My confidence in my ability is nothing. 
nothing. My confidence is in this. Your word, oh God, shall be established forever. Your word is from everlasting to everlasting. And I'm going to begin to remind you of your own word because it's a promise and it's sure because it came from the king. It's not my word, it's your word. It's not my promises, it's your promises. You are, the Bible said, God, the Bible calls the Lord the author and the finisher of our faith. And let me tell you something, he's not just the author and the finisher, he's everything in the middle too. He's everything in the, in the middle. He's from the beginning to the end. He's everything in the middle Oh, as we, we've said this here before, you, uh, the, the, the difference in this race that you're running of life, we run, we're running a, a race of life. You know, you run a race, there's a man there at the beginning of the race and he takes a pistol and he blows the trigger. And he pulls the trigger and the, the shot goes off and everyone goes running. There's something very unique about this race of life though because the same man who pulled the trigger to start the race is actually the same man at the finish line waiting to congratulate you when you cross your finish line. Why? Because he's the author and he's the finisher. You know what else he is? He's also the, the audience uh, cheering you on. He's also the man there with a the cup of water to say, take a drink. You can make it. Keep going. Keep pressing. You've almost crossed the finish line. He's there if when I breathe my first breath. He's there when I breathe my last breath. And he's there all in the middle, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it doesn't make sense. Musicians, could you come? Even when it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> you remind him of his own word. You promised, Lord. You're bound to a promise, God. Bless the Lord. Amen. You said these people are your seed. And that your seed would last and endure forever. You started it, Lord. It's not making much sense right now. You know, there's times in your life when it does. <clears throat> there's times in your life when you, you have a feeling at least. <laughs> Stand to your feet. There's times in your life you have a feeling, of maybe a sense of security. That's all. I got it figured out. You know, I got it. Got planned for my life. And looks like it's all going to go. You know, but if we'd be honest here today, there are times when we can feel like that one day, one year, one set of years, and then suddenly we enter into a place in our life where it just, what happened? It just doesn't make sense, Lord. It's not making any sense. What's, you could feel that way even now. So, Lord, it's not making sense. What's happening in the world today? What's happening? How long is this going to last? What, what, what's, what's taking place right now, Lord? You could feel like you got it all figured out. And then there's other times you say, Lord, it just doesn't. This don't feel like it makes any sense to me. It's David says, pray. David prayed, you know, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? Is it just going to be that way? Is it going to be like this forever? How long will it? And sometimes as we said at the beginning, it just can drag out like Joseph. It drags out for years like Paul and Felix. It goes for years, two years in prison. How long will it go, Lord? But let me just remind you here this morning. He's the God in the whole picture. Amen. And He's everything at the beginning. He's everything at the end. And He's everything in between. And you need to do this today. I promise it'll help you. You remind God of His Word. Just as Moses did. Moses reminded Him. He said, Lord, this is Your Word. Yeah. God, Moses, I'll go with you. I'll give you rest. That's good, God. That's good. I, I believe it, Lord. I, I accept it, Lord. I, I, I trust in it, Lord. I, and yet, no doubt, you know, we could look like Moses and thank goodness. You know, how long is it going to take you to get it, Moses? <laughs> how long? How, may, how much is God going to have to say? I mean, isn't it enough? As I read Exodus 32, I say, Moses, <clears throat> let me just tell you something, buddy. Right before I read that entire perplexing conversation that you just had with the Lord, I read that God spoke to you face to face as a man speaks to another man, to his friend. Huh. And I want to let you know, Moses, um, I've never experienced that. I've never had a chance to sit down with God. I've talked to him, felt him in my soul. I've never sat down and got a, had to have a conversation. 
If Moses is, I want you to catch this. If Moses could sit face to face and talk to God as a man talks with his friend and still question, not the word, but the man, the vessel, the promise. If he could do that with a face to face conversation, how much more us here today could we get to a place in our own hearts where we're going, I just don't know, Lord. Just doesn't make sense, Lord. And you could say, Moses, my goodness, Moses, how much is it going to take? How much more is God going to have to do to get your attention, to give you confidence that it's him? How much more is he going to have to say? God, if you don't go for me, Moses, my presence will go with. That's good, God. But if you don't go, don't even send us because uh, how will that people know? My presence will go. You found grace. If I found grace in your sight, you found grace in my sight, Moses. You know, you just look at it and go, my goodness, you know, God, you know, could have just looked at him and said, you know what? Just forget it, Moses. My goodness. How many times do I got to tell you? How sure do I got to? You know what? You know what, Moses? You know what? (laughs) Never mind. Harry, I'm face to face. I've already given you my word two or three times and you're still questioning the word. I am so glad that God didn't do that to Moses. I'm so glad he didn't push him aside. I'm so glad he doesn't cast him aside, but he just keeps talking to him and he keeps communing with him and he keeps telling him, God could say to me, how long is it going to take you? How how many times, uh, how many times the devil could say, uh, how many times, uh, how much is it going to take for you to believe the word of God? Uh, How, when will you ever believe? God says, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep preaching it to you. I'm going to keep telling it to you. I'm going to keep expressing it to you. And you may walk out of here today and doubt it tomorrow. Will you give up on me then, God? No. I'll just keep talking, Moses. I'll keep preaching, Moses. I'm going to keep standing, Moses. Until when? Until you believe, Moses. I'm going to keep on pouring it on you, Moses. Because it's not always going to make sense. Bow your heads with me here this morning. Not always going to make sense. It doesn't always make sense. When it didn't make sense to Moses, he reminded God of his word. When it didn't make sense to Jehoshaphat, he begins to remind God of his own word. This is your people. This is your seed. You said your seed would last forever, and we are your seed. I wonder if you could do that today, maybe by an uplifted hand. Say, Lord, this is your word. This is not my word. This is your promise. This was not my promise. I'm only here because you put me here. I didn't start this, Lord. I surely can't finish it. I didn't put myself here. I didn't one day decide I wanted to serve you, but you came looking for me. You came searching for me. You found me, Lord. You cleaned me. You saved me. You sanctified me. This is your promise, oh God. This is your word and you're bound, your duty bound. Oh, as your prophet said, God keeps his word. I raise my hands today, Lord, and I I confess that with faith. I confess it with my mouth. God, you keep your word. Thank you, Lord, for something that we can trust, that we can rely upon, something that we can anchor our soul to. This morning, Lord, though the world is shaking, though it's so uncertain, uncertain for tomorrow, uncertain for next year, Lord, but we're your children. That's what's sure. We may not know what tomorrow holds, but as the song says, we know who holds tomorrow. Oh, Lord, we're we're grateful this morning to be called your children, to be called your seed, Lord, that lasts forever, for it's your promise. For when you could swear by nothing greater, you swore by yourself. We stand upon it this morning, Lord. We raise our hands and we want you to know, Lord, by confession, we trust you. You're in control. You're sovereign. Your decrees are from everlasting to everlasting. They're eternal. They don't change yesterday. They didn't change. They're not going to change today. They're not going to change tomorrow. They're going to be still here after I'm gone. Your word will last forever. Thank you for that this morning, Lord. Bless every heart, every life. Jesus, we pray. What are you playing, Sister Joanne? Brother Brother Matthew, you could sing. You in the sunrise every morning. It's like a picture that you 
painted for me I love a letter in the sky Story, sing this Story I could I could have had a really different score, but you came, you came down from heaven down. to restore me. Forever saves my life. I stand. I stand in all of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you do. Sing the second verse, mountains you're breaking. Mountain, you're breaking, you're breaking down the weight of all my mountain. Oh, even when it feels like I'm surrounded. Here's a promise you never leave my side. Stand. I stand in all of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in awe in your amazing way. Oh, thank you, Lord. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Nobody loves me like you love. Oh, raise your hands and sing it now. And I stand in awe of your amazing ways. I worship you. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you do. He's got it all in control. Could you play that for me? And then let's sing this together. He's got it all in control, Brother Josh. In control. Oh, he's got it all in control. He put that reassurance way down in my soul. He's got it all. I put my life. I put my life in his hands. You want to do that today? Just before we go, I put. I put my life in his hands. So every road I walk down, I'm sure it's in his plan. I put my life. Hand. My father knows, my father knows what I need. Oh, yes, he does. My father knows just what I need. What I need. And everything I go through, he knows what's best for me.
My Father knows. My Father, Father knows what I need. One more time. My Father knows. My Father knows what I need. Yes, you do, Lord. My Father knows what I need. Everything I go through, you know what's best for me. My Father knows. God bless you, friends. You can be dismissed. We'll see you Wednesday night. He's got it in control. He's got it all in control. He's got it all in control. He put that reassurance way down in my soul. He's got it all. Start to the finish, I need more.